started. Um, hello everyone and thank you again for joining us and taking your lunch break to be with us. Hope you've all got something tasty. Um, and also for sticking with us, I know the, the event was rearranged, so thanks for coming back. Um, so it's great to have so many signups today. Um, this event, we're going to reflect on what has and hasn't changed for children in prison over the last 20 years since the Children Act case. I've got a few housekeeping rules and then I'll crack on with introducing the session. So basic housekeeping. And um, the first is that the event is being recorded. It will be sent to everyone that RSVP'd and it will be open uh, for anyone to watch after the event. Questions, please put any questions in the Q&A box. Feel free to do it as we go, but we'll answer them after we've heard from all of the speakers. Um, we're planning on the session being about an hour, but we've got a bit of extra time if we need it for any great questions that keep coming through. Um, we can't actually see you, so please use the chat box if you want to say hello, um, share your thoughts or add links to anything helpful, materials, organisations for everyone else listening. So Sinead's going to start with giving us a bit of context about the Children Act case and what the children's estate looked like at the time, how it looks now, and then talking a little bit more about our legal work. And then following that, we'll hear from a former client, Leon, reflecting on his experiences as a child in custody. Then Angus Jones, as you can see on the screen there, lead for children and young adults at HMI Inspector of Prisons. Armania Scott Samuels, Criminal Justice Project Coordinator at Leaders Unlocked. And Dr. Helen Woods, Co-Chair at the British Association of Social Workers Criminal Justice Group. So unless anyone has any questions at this stage, I'll hand over to Sinead. Thank you, um, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, I want to talk a bit today about what has and hasn't changed for children in prison since we took the Children Act case in 2002, um, and then talk a bit about what children calling our legal service are telling us. Um, I'm going to try and gallop through the first few slides because I think it will cover some of the things that our speakers will be talking about. Um, but just to sort of contextualise things, so in, in 2002, the Howard League went to court to fight for children in YOIs to have the same rights under the Children Act as, as their counterparts in the community. Um, and previously, prisons didn't have an obligation to, to safeguard the welfare of children, even where children were at risk of serious harm. Um, the challenge was successful, and since then, children in prison have been entitled to rights under the Children Act. But I think what, what is important to understand is the context in which the case was brought. Um, we brought the case and, and others had similar concerns about the treatment of children in YOIs at the time. Um, and the case shone a uh, light on um, the, the treatment of those children. And as a result, our legal service was set up so that those children in prison could contact us for free independent legal advice. Um, I've just put in here some quotes from the judgment um, where uh, Mr. Justice Mumby, as he was then, talks about um, what life was like for children in YYs. And he says, as might be imagined, um, these the experiences vary dramatically. Many are heartwarming, but in others, the picture was darker, sometimes much darker. Um, and he goes on to give examples or cite examples um, of some of the reports that had been, had been issued at the time. Um, I guess we're looking at what's changed. So the most significant thing that has changed since 2002 is a dramatic reduction in the number of children in prison. So at the time we took the case, um, there was almost 3,000 children in prison, um, and now there's less than 450. But when we look at who those children are, there's still lots more to be done. Um, so if we look at the, the diagram here, we can see that the number of children, of white children, and the number of children from racially minoritized communities are almost um, the same, and there's a dramatic overrepresentation of um, racialized children. Um, I think what we need to look at um, when we're looking at the numbers of children in custody is the number of children on remand. Um, I borrowed this slide in the next from a colleague who held um, an event last week about what an anti-racist youth justice system would look like. Um, and we can see two things. Firstly, we can see that the remand population is declining at a much slower rate than the number of sentenced children. But more concerningly, what we can see is that the number of white children who've been remanded has declined significantly in the last decade, but the number of racialized children in remand has stayed um, roughly the same. And most significantly, um, there are as many black children as there are white children on remand at the moment. 
Um, the Howard League is doing some work in this area. So in spring 2020, we started a project um, funded by the Big Lottery looking at uh, the experiences of children on remand and we're continuing to do this work and um, there's been a change in law so in June 2022 the law on remanding children um, changed hopefully for the better but we're waiting to see what the statistics show us. Like the next thing to look at is what life is sorry which children are going into prison so in 2002 Mr Justice Mumby um, gave a to sort of a description of the vulnerabilities of those children and the difficulties that they faced. Um, and I've said it out here, but it's children who are care experienced, children who've suffered abuse, children who have learning needs and children who have mental health needs. And unsurprisingly, the children in prison today, um, the cohort is the same. Um, so the Justice Committee's inquiry, um, which was launched in 2019, looking at the experiences of children and young people in the youth justice system, described um, the children as some of the most vulnerable children in society. And again, the same issues about mental health needs, learning disabilities, and being care experience was raised again. Um, and this is just um, the Children's Commissioner at the time talking about um, the figures that we need to hold on to and the fact that half of children in custody have been in care. Um, I want to look briefly at placement of children. I know this is something that Angus will talk about, um, but there's a couple of sort of striking things to look at. Uh, the first is that the Taylor Review in 2016 said that yachts and secure training centres should be replaced by smaller secure skills schools. Um, and almost seven years later, um, a secure school is yet to open. Um, it's one of the issues that children call our, our legal advice line about. Um, and I think the difficulty is that because of the number of types of establishments that children can be placed in, there's sometimes confusion about where children can be placed, where they can ask to be placed, um, and how they can they can arrange or ask to be transferred. Um, for us as an organisation, one of the most concerning things is that following the closure of Rainsbrook in December 2021, girls are now being placed in a YOI for the first time. Um, I want to talk now just about our legal work. Um, so we've had, as I said, we've had a legal service since 2002. It's the only dedicated legal service for children and young people in prison. Um, we advise and represent young people who are 21 and under on prison law and community care issues. And we've got a free advice line that's open four days a week that children can call us on or family members or professionals working with those children can contact us on for advice. Um, the most significant thing for us as lawyers in the last 20 years in terms of providing legal advice to children um, is the long lasting impact of the legal aid cuts. So in April 2013, the scope of legal aid was dramatically cut. Um, and much of the work that we do now in our in our legal work um, is advising young people for free because there isn't legal aid available. Um, the intention when legal aid was cut was that children would complain. So if they weren't happy about um, an aspect of their treatment or they didn't feel that they were able to progress through their sentence, um, they could put a complaint in. And of course, that when, when deciding that, the government hadn't taken account of the fact, firstly, that children have very low expectations about their rights. We know that children don't complain. Um, and that was something that came out of the ICSA inquiry that children just don't complain. They don't expect to be treated um, properly or expect that they can raise concerns. But also that complex, the, the multiple disadvantage that I talked about at the start, um, with mental health needs, learning needs, dis, um, issues with being able to read and write prevents children from complaining. Um, and so much of the time what we're doing is assisting children and young people to make those complaints and advising them about their legal rights. Um, I've got a spreadsheet here just showing the types of things that children and young people call us about. Um, and it's a mix of uh, resettlement, so planning for release, progressing with their sentence, um, their treatment, adjudications, parole and recall, and so on. Um, I want to talk about three things that children are telling us about at the moment and um, before I finish. Um, and the first is that they are isolated. Um, so in 2017, the Howard League brought a case um, challenging the treatment of a child who had spent um, over 100 days being separated from his peers in a YOI. Um, and some six, almost six years later, children are still calling us, telling us that they're experiencing the same thing. So in the last month we've heard from a number of children at a YOI who have told us that they've been separated from their peers for weeks and months at a time. 
Um, and we've got significant concerns about how they're being treated and about whether procedures have been properly followed. Um, so they've told us they're not having the opportunity to make representations before being separated, which was something that was established um, in the case of SP, a case that the Howard League brought many years ago, which established that children before being separated, because it's such a significant um, step, should be given the opportunity to explain why they shouldn't be separated, and that's not happening. Um, we're seeing children accessing a limited regime while they're separated from their peers, um, and that's linked to lack of um, adequate education provision, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, we hear about children not being given meaningful targets, they're told to behave, but they're not told exactly what they need to do, or told how they will achieve those targets to bring their separation to an end. Um, and concerningly, community-based professionals are not being invited to participate in reviews. So one of the things that the Children Act case in 2002 established was the importance of external scrutiny. So when children are being detained by the state, it's important that when there are concerns about their welfare, local authorities are able to check in on those children um, and children in separation are entitled to have their youth offending team workers and have their social workers attend the reviews and um, we're hearing from children that that's not happening. This, um, I've, I've just put up on the screen um, a table um, that came from um, it was some statistics earlier in the month that was released by the prisons minister and it shows that children in all of the YYs um, are spending periods of time in separated, being separated from their peers. Um, and we can see that that's not, not just for one or two or three days, but there's children being separated for much longer. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was the issue of education, and this is something that the Howard League has been concerned about and something that children tell us about. Um, children tell us that the quality of education that they get and the quantity of education that they get um, isn't sufficient. So the policy is that all children um, in YYs are meant to receive 27 hours a week of education and three hours of physical education, and children routinely aren't receiving that. And um, we did a briefing last year with Ipsy, who are a charity that provide um, independent advice and support to children with special educational needs and disabilities in England. Um, and we did this um, guide on education inside penal detention. Um, and we were able to sort of highlight the issues that children were telling us about. So as well as per provision of education, we know that children um, with special educational needs are not having those needs understood and, and met. Um, children who are meant to have education, health and care plans don't have them or where they do have them, they're of poor quality and the support's not being provided. Um, planning for education on release is inadequate because there's not an understanding of what children um, need, what children's educational needs are, and also because of the concerns around resettlement planning generally, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, and finally, the law and practice for children in custody is not equivalent to that in the community. So in the same way as in the Children Act case in 2002, we had concerns about a different treatment of children in the community and children in prison. Again, children in custody are disadvantaged because they can't, the mechanisms for, for establishing their rights are not the same. Um, and this is a quote from a young person, a child, um, who was on remand that we work with as part of our remand work. And he says, we go to education, but you don't learn. I asked for one-on-one, -on -one, but they don't have enough staff. You don't learn in a classroom of five boys walking around shouting. And the final thing I just wanted to highlight was the issue of um, resettlement and um, children don't have suitable accommodation to be released to. And um, this has always been a large part of the work that the legal team at the Howard League has done. Um, and the law is well established in part um, because of the many cases that we took in, in the 2000s to establish the duties. The issue now is that there is a lack of suitable accommodation and support being identified but for children or being reserved for children either in advance of their release or to enable their release, whether that's on parole or um, on early release. Um, and the impact that that has on the rest of release planning is profound. So if you don't have um, accommodation in place, then it's hard to put in place educational provision. It's hard to put in place mental health support. It's hard to put in place practical support. And we're seeing it now with 18 being viewed as it is in other parts of the, of the system as 18 being a cliff edge where the amount of support that those children receive is reduced 
um, accommodation is more difficult. Um, it, it's less likely to be reserved for them or arranged for them. And there's a move towards other types of accommodation, um, such as approved premises, which typically would never have been suitable for, for young adults. Um, and I want to finish, I guess, just by saying what we'd say to our clients, which is we as adults wouldn't move house next week. We wouldn't, um, without knowing who we were going to live with or knowing where we're going to live. And yet the most vulnerable children in society um, are expected to do just that. They're expected to wait until the day or two days before release and um, before finding out where they're going to be living. Um, and that, that, that's a problem um, and a problem for the young people that are contacting us. Thank you, Sinead, doing all the hard work there. Um, I'm now just going to introduce, uh, we want to share with you a short recording from one child who rang our legal advice loan line some time ago. Uh, his name is Leon. Um, this is him reflecting on his experiences of going to prison for the first time during COVID. The first night, so this is the first night I've ever gone to prison. I've gone through the gates, um, gone up to reception. They haven't put me in um, like one of the side rooms. They've just let me sit and hang around in like the reception bit waiting like sat on the chairs next to the officers and stuff obviously then i'm just obviously annoyed at one that going to jail going to prison whatever um missing the outside already but then obviously they transfer it probably took two hours to get actually in my cell um had a shower um then went on down to my cell and then it's like that was it sort of thing um they come and give me a tv and then that was basically it until like the next morning. Um, social worker from jail come and see you, speak to you. Then when you go in the exercise yard, I think it's people like um, the gang people. So they ask you if you obviously you're in gangs, but obviously where I'm from, different area. Not it's not predominantly made for me. You'd go shower. You'd have half hour in the shower half hour on exercise yard, then that was it, basically your whole day. Or maybe like someone would come down, like your social worker would speak to you, but that'd only be for like a brief 15 minutes. So you are basically doing like 23 hours in the cell. I didn't really have a lot of contact with anyone other than my yacht worker. I feel like it was more just left to my yacht worker. And I didn't really have a plan or really anything I just sort of knew that I'm remanded till this date um, and then I think it is appearing back at court to see if anything further had happened with house placements because I'm pretty sure I got remanded because I had nowhere to live and then they was finding housing for me or something like that. But then when I um, got to the placement um, so like you're just you're obviously not in prison, that's for one. Um obviously I had certain conditions that I have to be in at seven, but um where I still COVID in the placement, no one was allowed in the placement, but I'd still be allowed to ha um have a few people come outside the placement or just hang around the placement near there just to obviously you're not in prison, you're you've now got freedom, which is a lot better. Um also I felt like at the placement, um my key worker, he was really good. Um that like proper supportive, he knew more about like up and coming activities than I did. Like he'd always come knock my door, oh, yeah, Leon, you got this to do today, this person coming to see you today, you gotta to do this today, we're gonna to do this today. Yeah, he was really good. Going to the court, um, my yacht worker, my placement manager there, my mum's there. Um we also had loads of um, forms like references to say what good stuff I'd been doing. Um, the judge basically went out of the room, said, I'll oh, think, and then come back out and said, within due care, um, I sent you to custodial sentence. Da, 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 da. But me being a young person, and um, <clears throat> when he said all of these words, custodial, all of these things, they were quite big words to me, and I didn't really know what it meant. So when he, when he had said it, funnily enough, I had kind of like, thought that he had said, oh, I'm not going to jail. And then because he was saying custody concurrent and all these big words, and I didn't really get what was going on. And then 
I was like, basically, I thought I got happy, was about to say, oh, yeah, yeah. And then I turn around and I see like four or five of the GOV workers walking in the court and it was like, oh, well, well don't, maybe not. And I just basically got up and just clapped at the judge, walked out in a strop, like said to my mum, stop crying, whatever. And yeah. Me, I'm a proper sociable person, so I don't. I just don't like the fact of you get chucked in a room, the door gets shut, and then that's it. I'm more of a like, I understand all of the points of oh, you've done bad and things like that, but you don't need to have like your whole identity and personality and humanity chucked away from you. Like you're still a human, you're still a person at that point. Like I don't just need to be chucked in a room and the door shut on me like I'm a dog in a cage. Thank you to Leon for that and also Katie for putting it all together. Um, so now we're going to hand over to the rest of our panellists, um, starting with Angus. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as um, I've already been introduced, um, my name's um, Angus. I'm um, one of the inspection team leaders at the Inspectorate with responsibility for leading on children's establishments. Um, and what that means for the prison inspectorate is secure training centres and uh, young offender institutes. So I'm going to give this a go and see if I can share my my presentation. But if not, we'll we'll do without. Um, so let's see where we get to. Ah, here we are. Great. Um, so I think you know that when I look over the sort of ten years or so I've been involved in children's custody. Um, and the 10 years before that, I think what stands out for me is while there's been lots of progress, is this this sort of missed opportunity for um, for long term and sustained um, gains that have been made uh, and, and too much reacting to a crisis here, some pressure there um, and perhaps uh, tokenistic stuff happening, which, you know, is a step forward in some respects, but isn't hugely um, transformative in, in, in others. Um, we don't inspect secure, tra uh, secure children's homes. Um, they're done uh, with Ofsted and the CQC. Um, but I'll come on to some of the issues with uh, inspection and fragmentation of the estate as well. So as we've just heard, uh, 20 years is a long time, but particularly in children's custody. And I think we really should celebrate some of, some of the things that have happened. So. It is undoubtedly a really positive thing that there are only 450 or so children in custody today. Um, you know, it would be better if that was less, but people used to say we had really high rates of incarceration of children in this country. And that's certainly no longer the case when you compare England and Wales um, to uh, a peer group of other nations, um, really significant reductions in, um, in, in the population. Um, and that reduction in population starting off about 15 years ago, um, that created an opportunity to reform the entire estate um, and to change what was what was happening in, in prisons. Unfortunately, as those as the uh, population changed, um, what we had was a desire to close entire institutions very, very quickly. Um, and that's left us with a group of establishments to hold children that are broadly speaking in the wrong place. We've got far too few placements in London. We've got far too few placements in the Northwest of England. And so we're simply exporting children from these big population centers to, uh, to places like Stoke or Kent or, or South Wales. You know, So that's not a great way to be, you know, that's not not where you'd start if you started designing um, the estate that 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 um, that you would need for children. And what sat behind those decisions was a a real desire to take cost quickly out of the system as the population reduced. And it would have been perhaps more sensible to close wings on parts of institutions first, and then decide where those children, where was best for those children, rather than what was the, the needs of the, of the system that was holding them. 
Um, we've also, alongside that, in 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 sort of uh, the the mid twenty uh, tens, um, found reorganisation of staffing. Now, this was interesting because it wasn't really driven by any need to take cost out of the children's estate. It was de deci decided because of cost based savings that were needed to be taken out in the adult estate and because it's one prison service YOIs are run by the prison service the reorganization of staffing created some implications for the children's estate and that basically meant that experienced uh, members of staff left um, and there was um, significant shortfalls for a good deal of time again a missed opportunity for sustaining progress and completely needless. You know, it wasn't it wasn't necessary to regrade the post they regraded in 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 the um, in the YOI estate. We've also over that time seen a huge difference in the type of offences that we see in custody or the type of children that other the crimes that have been committed by the children that we see in custody. This is um, actually the logical. Um, conclusion of reducing the population because obviously what you do when you reduce the population you're diverting children from custody the easiest children to divert from custody are those that have committed the more minor offenses um, and so what you end up with is a, is a concentration of um, higher tariff offenses um, in custody so we're now at about 70 percent for violence against a person compared to about 20 percent 10 years ago and if you add on top robbery um, to to um, to that number, you get you get pretty much um, the overwhelming majority of the of the population. Um, we've also seen the decline or demise of the uh, detention training order, so short sentences designed for children. Um, we've talked about the increase in the proportion of children on remand. It's really important when we talk about increases that actually this is in the context of overwhelming decreases. So all increases are proportionate, they're not actual numbers. Um, and, um, and the increase in the proportion of longer sentenced children, which again is linked to the change in the population, that creates real problems because typically you have higher need children committing these higher tariff offences. Um, and that means that the, the resource that's needed for those, those children um, and the challenges presented um, to uh, those responsible for caring for them are, are greater than they were um, 10, 20 years ago. Um, um, and when we focus on outcomes, the sort of findings from inspection are quite depressing in many respects, because despite the resource allocated, despite the drop in population, despite numerous attempts to make progress in key areas like education, we've not seen the progress that we would have liked to have seen. So the prison inspector expects that children are out of their cell uh, for 10 hours a day at least, and we expect them to be in education for a similar amount of time to their peers. What we've found is that time out of cell is much, much less than that, typically averaging somewhere between four and six hours of during the week and much less at the week weekend. And that that hides huge variations. We've also seen increases in violence, self-harm and use of force, all as a proportion or a rate rather than absolute numbers because of the reduction in population. And the year following the opening up the regimes from the pandemic, we're already seeing pre-pandemic trends continue in terms of, um, of, of, of incidents. I've talked about lack of long-term reform. So while we've seen, well, now we've got dedicated bodies responsible for um, the children's estate. So the Youth Custody Service is a, um, a directorate within the prison service. Um, and lots of the process of stuff that we see in custody is a bit different to the adult estate. Too often, change has been in a reaction to a crisis rather than delivering a coherent system for children. And we're still in this um, position of most children being held in YOIs. So somewhere between three quarters and four fifths of all children are held in YOIs. And, you know, by the time we do get to open the secure school, we'll have four models of custody for half a high school's worth of children. No one 
can explain to me what those four models of custody are for. And I've been inspecting two of them for the last nine years, and I couldn't properly tell you why we needed those two different types of establishments and what the differentiation was, um, apart from a real accident of history. So there's some real need for some grip over the system going forward. And to look at what we need to do as a society is we get we spend a huge amount of money on these children. They're real um, employment opportunities. You know, each one of these children is employing six or seven other people looking after them in prison. Um, you know, say it quietly, inspecting those institutions. Um, and just the cost to the prison service is, is around now about £350,000 per child per year. You know, and we just need to get more from that. How does that come to two hours out of the weekend of four, four to six hours at, during the week? It, you know, we need to have higher aspirations for that input. There needs to be institutions in the right place that are designed for children and meet their needs. I don't really mind what we call them, but the current setup doesn't work. There needs to be some more thought about how many prison officers we have. And we need to get rid of these huge unwieldy management teams that are in lots of these institutions. I was in one last year looking after about 60 or 70 children with 55, 60 managers. I think that that, that hinders accountability. And that's a classic um, example of somewhere where you could reinvest in the front line, creating better care for children. And then I think we need to look at some of the upstream issues that lead to the over-representation uh, over of children from a, from a black or a, or a minority ethnic background in prison, as well as other groups as, you know, that, 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 that are massively over-represented, including um, the uh, children from a uh, gypsy, Roma or traveller uh, community. So I'll stop there because I think I've gone wildly over time, but thanks very much. And I will hand over, I think I've stopped sharing. Um, and I will hand over to um, Amania um, from Leaders Unlocked. Thank you so much, Angelus, um, for setting the stage. And thank you all for being here. My name is Amania, Scott Samuels. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Leaders Unlocked and give you a case study within a case study within a case study. Um, so firstly, Leaders Unlocked, we are a social enterprise. We specialize in embedding youth participation through personal development and peer research um, across the health, justice, well-being and policing sectors and education. Um, and we have done a range of work within the criminal justice system uh, and within the secure estate through another project of ours that you might have heard of, the Young Justice Advisors. That primarily was peer-to-peer -peer research, um, consultation, and um, recruitment to our pro projects um, of people that had lived experience of the justice system. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the Young Advocates Project. It is our first project that we've done with like under 18s um, or looking at the youth justice system specifically. And it is for 12 to 21 year olds that have lived experience of the justice system. So that's from all the way to policing to custody, of course. Um, before I talk about that, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I am born and raised in Brixton. And in all honesty, even though I've loved criminal justice my whole life, um, I didn't went all the way and got my master's. The secure state is something that I personally was not in a rush to jump into. And that is due to personal experiences, seeing friends and family go in one way and come out a different way. So I personally didn't feel like I wanted to be part of that system when I had no belief in its, you know, fit for purpose status. Um, but as many of us probably on this call did during COVID, um, it presented an opportunity for us to adapt our work. So the Young Advocates Project was launched in 2020, and it's, an, it's a partnership with the Alliance for Youth Justice, who are a membership organisation, do all sorts of great lobbying um, for youth justice reform. And as I mentioned, it is for children with lived experience of the justice system who are empowered and emboldened to reform it primarily through peer-to-peer -peer engagement. So you already heard from one of our founding young advocates already, that's Leon, and he is a testament to 
the power of the project and the power of the young people that have had these experiences. Um, so a bit of background, initially in 2020, I was meeting the young advocates every three weeks on a Saturday morning on Zoom. Can you imagine? I can't, I can't believe I even managed to get them out of bed now I think about it. But at that time, we did have two children that were in a secure children's home. So this is the first thing I would like to highlight in terms of the biggest change I've seen, in terms of my personal hopes, um, none of the work I have done with the children I'm going to speak about today would have been possible without the staff that see and feel and know those um, children's thoughts and insights day in and day out. And as Leon mentioned in his testimony or in his um, story, connects the dots with the opportunities. So we had two children in the secure children's home and everything we do at Leaders Unlocked is youth led. So I'll share my screen just for this one section, just to give you an idea. Um, this is one of the priorities that the young advocates chose. It is of course custody. So you can see here, I chose this priority because of my own experience with people going to jail and I want to help young people with not reoffending. Right now, all jails are functioning way below expectations and they set us up to fail because different jails are, do and are good for different things. So this is something that Angus and Sinead has really touched on, the idea that where you're placed, we don't know what the logic is or why, is it down to availability? Is it down to specialism? Mm. So the Young Advocates did choose this priority initially. We delved into it. You can see here, we did have visitors from the Howard League come and chat to the Young Advocates to get their thoughts, but also inform them more on some of the stuff that we've heard about already today. Um, and it was great because like lots of this stuff and lots of the thinking that went into this, what came directly from Leon and the two children that were in the secure children's home at the time. And they led on this work and they interviewed children and young people across this work. They gathered this data that you can see the findings very much in line with some of the stuff we've heard already today. Um, and it was during the research phase of this priority that I wanted to mention another boy that we are working with. I will call him D'Angelo. Um, so we can talk about Leon, who was very, very committed and interested and passionate about this topic. So we spent a lot of time as a group and individually developing research skills, uh, public speaking skills, all of the principles of like safeguarding, um, peer-to-peer -peer engagement and facilitation. And Leon conducted an interview with a child who'd been in prison since he was 13. I was there supervising, of course, taking notes. And um, I mean, long story short, this is a child that had been excluded from many schools, had been exploited before, I mean, at that point, he still didn't necessarily comprehend what exploitation meant, um, but was just so eager to lap up education, wanted to learn about education. Speaking to this point in blue, was already in the process of trying to be transferred to an establishment that he knew by word of mouth was better for education. Like, that's ridiculous if, you, if we're thinking about it. Um, it shouldn't be on a 14, 15 year old child to find out where his resettlement process is going to be better um so but yeah they established a really great connection and his interest in reforming the justice system not just custody across um across the system preventative work and resettlement work too really really carried him forth and i've been working with him for two years since then and i really just wanted to highlight the fact that working in the secure state, much like the establishment of the Howard League demonstrates, does force us to make necessary enhancements to our practice, even on a personal level. So I wanted to talk about, again, the staff members that have been supporting. Once this boy moved from the secure children's home to a YOY, only because of specific individual staff members was he able to continue participating on the project. So he's engaged with us for an average of three to six hours every month. He has um, engaged with the Ministry of Justice, the Youth Justice Board, um, the Children's Rights Alliance for England. He hosted a lunch and learn with his fellow young advocates 
with like senior home office um staff members really giving them that first-hand insight in terms of um I guess the misconceptions that I guess pot potentially we're all um guilty of in terms of what we see children in custody as being capable of or dealing with. So I wanted to talk about Rottle, which is released on temporary license. This is something that I did not believe was possible. Obviously, I didn't say that to any of the young advocates that were in the secure establishment, but it's something that you don't necessarily believe is um, likely due to many of the issues that we've heard, like over understaffing or high staff turnover or um, lacking trust in the individual's, you know, um, ability to function in certain situations. But this young man was given role for the first time to attend one of our meetings in November. And the thing that I was most struck by was Leon. Well, both of them, but Leon thinking back to that day one, putting himself in that sh in the shoes of his interviewee. How is he feeling? What would he like to talk about right now? What can we do to make the most of the time out of the cell? To, he's gonna be walking into a situation with these young people that he doesn't know. He rallied up every other young advocate in the room. He took control of the icebreaker. Um, he welcomed him in really, really beautifully, seamlessly. And the rest of that day was, pretty amazing like it was very as always peer-to-peer -peer led so we had feedback previously that rather than always focusing on personal lived experience maybe we could focus on things that have been in the news or cases that are high profile so that when we're in meetings and we're talking to um senior people or staff members that basically we're taking an evidence-based approach and that day I saw many children that have been excluded from school multiple times have been denied opportunities to participate in their cases or their resettlement plans or their um, court hearings, teaching each other about criminalization, about joint enterprise, about strip searching of police and um, by police and disproportionality. And that to me was, um, very, very striking because it's like wherever any establishment I go to, even some of the things that you see here, if I don't want to leave, if anything makes people want to stay here or first time I was in jail, I was causing trouble, but now I'm older, so I'm more mature. Um, now is the time to sort out my life. These can be children that are denied time out of their cell or denied education because there's not enough staff that day, but they, still wake up every morning like hopeful and excited or interested and intrigued by things and I think that Sinead mentioned resettlement issues and the issue with accommodation and that is something that is paining me at the moment because there are young advocates that have um been close to taking that next step and have done everything in their power to set themselves up to be prepared for that, whether that's getting qualifications. We gave Leon 11 AQA qualifications during his time on the project for various things such as um, leadership, peer research, uh, presentation. The other boy also received, I think, seven in total within custody. And I think it just speaks to the fact that we really do need to be creative in the ways that we meet the needs of these children because yeah it's not um it's not um, yeah it's not right for them to be denied things based on historic or stigmatizing or um you know inherently oftentimes racist um labels so we talked about again different types of establishment and we know that black boys are disproportionately sent to yois and that disproportionately affects the access to education or even um contributes to risk factors which impact resettlement and where they can be placed, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the main thing I wanted to highlight was just that 
we, with our liberty and freedom and our roles and our, I guess, privileges and expertise, um, do have a responsibility to champion the voices and find creative ways to make sure that these children are heard and their needs are met in other ways. And for me, personally, I think I have been encouraged by the work that I've done with the Young Advocates and um, elsewhere in this Cure State because the children that I work with have not lost that spark in their eyes that so many of my peers did. The thing that made me scared to step into establishments before, I feel, is um, less of a certainty um yeah so really I wanted to speak to the power of perseverance that exists in each and every child in the secure state right now um and that is often matched but not always by the supporting staff and that really speaks to um their commitment and just that they just that we should commit to learning and improving um on the basis that they deserve it and that's about it really. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Oh, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Helen Woods now from the British Association of Social Workers. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Thank you. Um, that's fabulous. Um, so I'm Helen Woods from BASWA, uh, the Criminal Justice Section of BASWA, which is a British Association of Social Workers, um, and it's a real pleasure to be talking to you today. I only have one slide, you may be relieved to know, which I'll try and find. Um, okay. Hang on one second, I'll try and share that in a moment. Um, it was only really with the Baswork logo on, it doesn't want me to share just now, so never mind. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today as part of this event. So I'll tell you a little bit about Baswork's criminal justice group um, and a bit about our work. So we're a special interest group within Baswa, made up of a number of different members um, who have different backgrounds within criminal justice social work. And one of our main aims over the last couple of years um, has been to raise the profile of criminal justice social work in the UK. Because um, as we know, since probation and social work split in terms of education, um, it's become something of a neglected area of social work practice, and we're really keen to raise the profile of the work that's going on um, in England and the wider UK. Okay, so um, we hold a number of events. Our membership is made up of um, social work practitioners in the criminal justice sector, and also those of us that work in higher education. Um, so I'm based at the University of Nottingham Trent and my co-chair Caroline Bald is at the University of Essex and we have a range of members um, from the Secure Estate as well. So in addition to raising the profile of the work that goes on and um, we're also concerned about a number of the issues that have been raised today already and I'm just going to touch on some of those. Um, it's a real pleasure to be speaking on behalf um, of the Howard League event. I know when I was an early practitioning social worker sort of 20 odd years ago, um, the Howard League were really important to me in terms of understanding what was happening in the wider sector and giving me an outlet for some of my um, kind of passion for practice, um, particularly in terms of, you know, it was sort of early, the early noughties when we had a rising custodial population um, and there seemed to be just no end in sight to the number of young people that were going to custody. So taking part in Howard League events and reading the material was really important to me and others as a practitioner at, at that period in time as it is now. So as colleagues have noted already, we've seen a huge reduction in the use of custody overall, which is a tremendous outcome given where we were in the early noughties and beyond, um, when custody seems to have been viewed as a positive choice um, on the back of the detention and training order, which had the education elements as well as the secure element. And a lot of um, the judiciary seems to really value having that option because they thought it was a route to addressing education needs in a secure setting. 
and compensating for the fact that some young people wouldn't go to education in the community. Um, so a lot of us at that time were putting considerable time and energy into trying to reduce the um, custodial population and arguing very strongly in favour of community penalties. And luckily that picture has shifted significantly in recent years, though as Angus um, and others have noted, we know what's, who the young people are who are going to secure settings and they're often the most vulnerable in society. So we know that the use of remand remains higher than we'd like it to be, um, although you know there are endeavours to, to bring that population down. Um, and we know that the majority of young people are accommodated in YOIs and that those who are sentenced to custody are most likely to be um, vulnerable and have significant uh, needs that have, not, that have often not been met and have been overlooked. Or are children who perhaps would have benefited from early intervention and support. And again, unfortunately, we've seen high levels of cuts to services that were best suited to provide some of that support. There's still too great a link between young people failing or being failed in education and ending up in the criminal justice system. So we know that young adults who receive custodial sentences had lower levels of educational attainment, according to ONS um, from 2022, and that more than half, at around 52% of young adults who received custodial sentences had been persistently absent during school, compared with 35.9% of those with non-custodial sentences or cautions. So there's still that connection between poor educational attainment and outcomes um, and receiving a secure sentence. We've also seen the development of the secure school model on the back of the Taylor review, um, the much delayed opening of the secure school um, at significant expense. And while there are many things about that model, such as its trauma informed approach, um, that sounds to be positive. Um, it does, as you know, as has been noted, add to this kind of multi-tiered model of, of custody. And again, it echoes a concern that I had when I started in practice around what happens if you tie education to secure um, care or secure or custody. Um, will we see again a rise in the secure um, population of children because it's seen as a solution to some of the problems that persist in the community? And that's a significant concern that I have as this model um, is rolled out. So um, we know that some young people under a tiered model of custody will fare far better than others in custody for similar offences and that's just not fair um, and we risk losing losing sight of the adverse impacts of custody particularly when it remo remo sorry, um, involves the removal of young people from their family or community and that's something we need to keep sight of because however um, we adapt secure care or secure education or just um, custody, um, it's still a huge upheaval for that young person and it's another upheaval and transition when they're released back into the community. So in addition to concerns about the state of custody for young people and the amount of time they spend in their cells with little or no education and training, we're also concerned about the impact of the reduced support in the community. And we see this, the current um, public sector under the, possibly the greatest strain that I've ever known it um, in my years in practice. So we have to um, think about the resources that are available in the community for early intervention, family support and through care and how we can build on these in our localities. Um, I'm really mindful of some research that was undertaken probably about three years ago now by Tom Disney, Lisa Warwick, um, Harry Ferguson and others um, entitled, isn't it funny that children, that when children are farther away, we don't think about them as much. And it looks at, amongst other things, um, when children are placed either as part of the care system or in secure care, um, further away from us in practice, they tend to, be, it tends to be a case of out of sight and out of mind. And certainly from a social work perspective, we have to think about um, what does that mean for us? You know, how can we stay attuned and in touch with young people who are in custody? How can we maintain our relationships with them um, when they're not immediately in front of us? Um, 
And I'd just like to, to wrap up really by encouraging us to think about the role of social work in youth justice. So a colleague of ours in the criminal justice group, Heidi Dix, um, recently gave a talk available through our website that questioned the role of social work in criminal justice, particularly given youth offending is managed under criminal justice and the, and the MOJ, um, rather than the Department for Education. Um, it feels crucial at the moment to consider the role of social work values and ethics at the present time in contributing to working with young people in criminal justice and how it's important to maintain a focus on the social in criminal justice rather than um, more individualised perspectives that seek to locate the problem in individuals and families. It's really important to highlight issues facing individual children in the system in terms of their background and particular needs, such as those, for example, who are considered to be neurodiverse. And again, that's a population we know to be overrepresented. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, thanks very much again for inviting um, myself and, and Baswa to take part in this event. We really appreciate that. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. And please feel free to get in touch if you're a social work practitioner and you might be interested in contributing to our group. Thank you, everyone. That was um, really interesting and lots of different things to say. And much to think about. Um, I'm going to go straight on to questions rather than having any wise um, summarising thoughts since um, given the time. So I've got a couple here. Um, I don't know, should I ask the question or should I leave it to the person who's answered? I'll ask the question, I guess. There's a couple um, that we've got about education. So um, I think it would be maybe best suited for Angus, the first one. The question is from Paula. Um, why does education not follow the national curriculum in prison? So I think the if well the 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 answer is is that it basically should so you should have something that broadly is equivalent. Now you've got to remember that your average prison population of children is very different to your average population in the community for all of the reasons that every panelist has said. You got a higher level of need. You've got many more staff to children in these education departments. Class sizes of three, two, and four are common across the estate. Um, the problem with um, what we've talked about in terms of time out of cell isn't necessarily all about education provision. It's about the barriers of getting children into a room with other children um, at the right time in, the, in front of the right um, teacher. And basically the problem is often conflict. So you end up with some children who are unable to mix with other children, and as soon as you've got a conflict, you have to half the education day unless you double the resource. And if you've got a third child who's in conflict with one of the two that I've just spoken about, suddenly your education day is in thirds and so on and so forth. And we often see this, this practice of keeper parts in YOIs is debilitating for anything positive. So in an institution like Feltham, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but we're talking somewhere in the region of 80 children. It would not surprise me if nearly all of them had a conflict with another child. And in total, the number of conflicts that they were managing was in the low hundred. So something like 200 or 300 conflicts. And when you're allocating children, what that means is you're allocated to a class that's more about where they can put you rather than what you need. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, definitely. And keep apart is something we hear a lot yeah. about on the advice line. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, the next question about education says, um, in resettlement, when going back to school, do the kids typically go to the school they came from and are the schools supported in supporting the kids coming back? Um, so just to interrupt that quickly, say Armania has to leave actually to go and speak to one of our clients. So thank you, Armania. Um, I'm sorry you're not here for the questions. Um, so we'll just return to the education question. I think I could probably answer that. The sad thing is, in the first instance, is that many of them aren't in school before going into custody because the people we're seeing go in are have already been excluded um, or don't have good attendance rates, aren't engaged in education anyway. Um, in terms of where they're coming out, um, your home, for the most part, your home local authority continues to look after you. Um, but we often see children redistributed, relocated, depending on safety issues, depending on um, where accommodation is even available, might be totally against their choice. So no, they're not always returning. 
to the same school or place. Um, and the third thing to answer that is really that because of the way Sinead was talking about release planning, um, and there's such an emphasis on the need to sort out the accommodation at the last minute, that um, education seems to be like the last piece in the puzzle which is put together, and um, certainly before coming out, even though ideally all of those things should be part of the pre-release meeting and part of people's pathway plans and um, and sort of being fed in, it's not, is the reality, um, certainly beforehand. And then we tend to not have as much um, involvement after they come out. Um, I'll move on to the next question then. Um, so um, this is another one for you, Angus, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> it says the HMIP surveys children SDCs and YOIs and publishes a report each year. I'd be interested in knowing if there's anything unexpected that came from the young people and how receptive are establishments to hearing their views? Um, so the latest um, survey report that we put together, I think we published last month, we tend to publish it in uh, January. Um, so it's on our website. Um, and there's a couple of things that we talk about there. It covered a period when institutions were just opening up following the pandemic and, um, and allowing more mixing between children. Um, and what it highlights is actually some gains from the, um, from the pandemic. I think that they probably, those opportunities have been lost as we speak now um, in uh, perceptions of safety, um, feelings about um, uh, staff, um, but what we appear to have lost um, is um, access to education, access to support in the community and access to visits. And we see a real drop off of these things that used to be pretty basic entitlements. So it's actually much more difficult now to work, you know, if you're a child to work out when you can get a visit, when, you know, and, and what days your wing often is is um, is able to get visits. So, and actually, I noticed another um, uh, question was around better practice. Um, and one of the depressing things around education um, not being as good as it was pre-pandemic, and it wasn't that good then. Let's get let's be serious. Um, is that it, this trade-off between safety and education wasn't necessary. So we, you know, we go to park every year and um, and in park, they've been running face-to-face -face education basically throughout the pandemic, which is necessary and, and all vulnerable children in the community have face-to-face -face education. Um, and they've also got a much better visits provision, including video visits um, provision. Than, uh, than 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 other sites. So this this, this trade off between stuff that is useful for you in the future and this basic safety stuff, I think, is a false conflict. There, I think I think that that, that these institutions should be doing both, um, and it's 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 not really a good um, it's not really um, acceptable that we see so many of them not. Sorry, the second part, are people interested? People are interested. I mean, there's actually very few uh, governors and directors of all levels that I speak to that want to run a bad service. Um, actually, lots of them are interested in what the children think. It's their ability to act on it in terms of the structures they're working within um, and their resource that often is the problem. Thank you. Um... Okay, Helen, I think this one's for you. So um, it's from Karen. Thanks to all the Howard League and speakers. I recognised all the issues as a social worker working in the youth secure estate currently and in the youth justice system, youth secure estate for almost 25 years. Uh, when will everyone realise that these are children we are working with and supporting? What on earth can we do to make things better, particularly care and custody, understanding the effects of trauma and building positive relationships? Thanks for that, Karen. I really share that um, sentiment. I mean, I think there are always good examples of practice across the sector, um, but what we don't have is consistently good practice that positions children as children rather than, you know, adultifying them and sort of positioning them as risky subjects who need to be have their, their criminal identities prioritised over the fact that they're children. Um, so 
I think going back to the sort of concern about a tiered model of custody, um, as I said, within the sort of the proposal around secure schools and some of the practice that's emerging, it does sound to be, you know, fairly sort of going in the right direction. But what we, we don't, we're very far from is having that consistently applied across the board. Um, so there are pockets where things, appear, you know, and some of the um, positive ex inspections um, may draw more on child centred models and, and relationship based practice. Um, but what we need is consistent practice across the board and, and that's more difficult to establish. And then also going back to something that, that no government seems to want to address of, around the age of criminal responsibility. Um, and perhaps until we sort of start with that, you know, um, we won't we won't be any closer to, to really seeing children as children. Um, so I don't have more positive answers for you in a way, but I think there are there are pockets, but they need to be brought together. Thanks, Helen. Um, I've got two questions from two different um, listeners about race. So the first one is, um, and I guess to anyone who feels appropriate to answer, um, are there any stats or research on why black children are referred to YOIs, um, referencing what Amania mentioned? And then the second question asked them both at the same time is, um, is the question of race now more dominant to deprivation with the progress achieved over the last past years? I can give it a go. Um, so the issue about placement and placement type, I think we need, I think there needs to be a lot more um, work done um, on this um, in terms of investigating what is it that makes a child go to a secure children's home, a secure training centre, a YOI, and at some point in the future, a secure school. Um, and some of that is about advocacy, some of that is about how good your yacht is, some of that is about how people perceive your risk. Um, and um, and in reality, while we know it, well, it, well, it certainly appears that there's a difference in the ethnicity of children in different sectors, I think we need to understand why, what's causing that difference, because actually what appears to me the, the key differentiation the differentiator between children in SCH and children in a YOI is the first thing, the children in the, y in the SCH haven't been rejected by the SCH placement, which can happen. Um, and secondly, they've got someone somewhere making that active decision, advocating for them to, 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 to be there. Um, the second point, there is a definite link between deprivation and incarceration. I've done work in loads of different jurisdictions. And, you know, you just if you go into their census data or, or their data on um, economic um, um, groups in their society, you find the most deprived. And I'll walk into a prison. I'll find lots, lots of that group in, in the prison. However, there's something over and above that. So there's some recent work done with, by the YJB around um, ethnicity and race and decision making in the wider youth justice system and even where you standardize for lots of stuff you still find something that you can't explain and I think that that needs to be addressed so there's so not all of this is a criminal justice pro problem but some of it is and so the criminal justice system needs to take responsibility for that part and try and and, and eliminate it the rest of it is you know societal problems I'm sure Thanks, Al. Um, Angus, really helpful. Um, just linking, there's another question here that I'm going to link back to the first thing you said there, the first part of your answer. Um, if you're allowed a view, um, what is your view on secure school project? Uh, to me? <laughs> um, so um, those of you that don't know, the chief inspector of prisons wrote the Taylor review um, way back when. Um, so my view is the problem with prison reform in general, and certainly youth justice reform, is that there is an underrating of the risk of doing nothing. So running Felton, running Cook and Wood, running Weatherby, Warrington, there may be great people doing nice stuff in pockets, but they're incredibly risky places to run. And they're open today with 400 children or 370 children in those particular institutions. Um, what people are overrate is the risk of doing something new and call it a secure school, call it a secure whatever, 
Um, I'm not really all that bothered, but I think what we need to do is have something that is purpose built for children that offers something different to what we've got now, because we've got facilities that just aren't fit for purpose, holding 75% of the children we've got in custody. So that the risk of doing nothing is far, uh, far, far higher than doing something. And even if some of those institutions aren't very good, you know, they, you know, the chance of finding something that's better is quite high by by innovating and do it and introducing something new. However, we've got to stop doing some of this other stuff as well. We can't just keep on layering on more and more sectors into this estate because it just it makes it makes no sense. Very diplomatic answer. Um... <laughs> but but to, to answer it directly, I'm not allowed a view, but that's my view in terms of new institutions and 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 um, uh, um, and reform in general. Yeah, helpful context. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here from Steph. It says, adult prisoners typically have huge physical and mental ill health problems and addictions. Are children the same and how well are they dealt with? Maybe, Sinead, you could answer that one. Um, yes, yeah, so I think the answer is, unfortunately, is yes. I think just looking at kind of how those children were described by the Justice um, Committee, it's, it's exactly those issues. I think what we're seeing with COVID, it's had a profound impact on children's mental health. Um, I think that in terms of how well um, they're dealt with, I think it depends on which establishment a child is in. Um, I think there's a difficulty we see sometimes with the young people that we're working with that if children are in on short sentences or if they're moved between establishments that disrupts things. Um, I think there's also an issue with children yeah, going in, leaving one establishment and, and coming back into another establishment and that disrupting things. Um, and another thing I guess we see through our legal work is the impact of risk and how that impacts on children being moved, for example, to hospital or going out to, to, yeah, to access external healthcare or um, issues with children, they're not being staffed to take children to healthcare or take children to appointments. Um, so I think probably the answer is yes, and it varies from place to place. I don't know, Angus, if you have anything else to add to that or Helen? I've got a comment for you this time, Angus. So you don't have to speak, you just have to maybe smile and nod. Um, it's from Maz. Angus, could your team change terminology employed in your inspection reports? So call young offenders children and change YOI to prison or children's jail. Ah, so we do call children children. Um, I, if there is a young offenders, it's got through our editorial process. And we've been doing that for some, certainly since I got this job. I, I, we, we haven't referred to young offenders, juveniles or anything like that. Um, we call YOIs YOIs because that's what they're called, unfortunately. So we just we 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 try and stick to thing, you know, rather than um, rather than changing the language. But you know, they are, to all intents and purposes, a type of prison. Thanks, Angus. Okay, I think we'll call this probably the last question. There are a couple more, um, and I'm not doing the best job at managing the Q and A box. Um, but um, for both of you, maybe if we could end on. Uh, Looking forward, any ideas for any easy wins? Potentially little cost, little effort, big impact to the children. Might be asking a lot about. I'd still, I mean, I touched on it earlier. I'd still like to see the age of criminal responsibility raised because I think symbolically it would just be so nice to see. And in terms of moving towards a um, child first model, you know, it, it gives a better message. Um, yes. That would be my hope. Um, it might not be um, easy, but it wouldn't necessarily cost any more. I think there is a real um, there is a real lack of allocation of resources to the people that see the children the most. So um, when I bang on about prison officers, I don't mind what they're called. You can call them youth justice workers, you can call them care officers that I don't mind. But the people in that role that see children the most, the, alloc the actual amount of the £158 million spent on children's custody that it actually goes to that front line should be higher. And the amount that goes through to elsewhere should be lower. There should be a real forensic look through the custody system to eliminate costs to reduce duplication and to make um, uh, to give frontline staff the time 
and the training that they need to do to do what they do better because actually loads of stuff in custody is about relationships I think Helen spoke about this earlier on and so long as you get the relationships right with the care staff and the children you can do you can move things on in a really positive way and as I say I think we've got lots of resource that's going away from the front line um, and, and will be better spent there. Thank you. I think um, one of the things that we sometimes hear about is linked to that relationships is relationships with professionals and access to those professionals from the young people. And some of these prisons have uh, phones in their cells. Um, some don't. Even when they've got the phones doesn't mean they're always on or that if they're out of their cell during that particular moment, they can't access the phone. Um, and just having things like unlimited numbers or quicker access to pins, um, you know, to, to putting professionals contact details on if you've got criminal matter and you need representation in two days time getting that sorted quicker um, and that opens up you know access to complaining access to um, your social worker your probation worker your yacht worker I think that's something that for us seems like would be an easy win and would certainly make a big difference to those relationships. Um, we have got a couple more questions in the box but maybe um, we'll see if there's any way we can reply to people individually so that everyone can go back to their jobs or get some lunch um, and just say a huge thank you to everyone, those that um, organised the event on our side and certainly to our panel members, Angus, Helen and Armani in her absence um, and Leon as well, obviously, and we hope you've enjoyed it and tune in for some more soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.